what, what is the conventional Anglo-centric narrative of, of the Battle of the Alamo? Uh, the Battle of the Alamo is the defeat of the Texian army at the hands of the Mexican army, led by General Santa Ana, who was also president of Mexico at that time. It, it came at the end of a 13-day siege where the Texians are remembered for the fact that they knew the odds were against them. They were approximately 190, 200 uh, Texians against the entire Mexican army and of thousands. Uh, they were not getting reinforcements. They didn't have a way out. They decided not to surrender. And they essentially went down in the battle. That's the battle as it's remembered, as this heroic last stand. It's also the part of the battle that gets universalized. I just saw an article last week about Mariupol in, in Ukraine that was described literally as Ukraine's Alamo. So it's been universalized as a historic last stand. It's a defeat that comes immediately before the eventual victory, the, Tex the Texian victory at San Jacinto by General Sam Houston, the defeat of the Mexican army and the capture of Santa Ana uh, at the battlefield. That, that battle, the victory at San Jacinto by the Texian army had to happen before you could commemorate the, the defeat at the Alamo. So it was a, it was a defeat uh, that essentially consecrated the ground. It consecrated Texas with this Texian. It's like blood. a holy ground there. Uh, it really is. And, and I mean, you could see that um, that holy ground is talked about that way. When you go there, you're meant to be uh, in a place that's uh, holy, hallowed, revered. You're, you, you're asked to take your hat off when you walk in. It's not an ordinary battlefield. It's, it, it really is, uh, has this uh, reverence around it that I believe lends a kind of, of um, legitimacy to the, the Texian cause, that they gave up their lives for Texas. Yeah. Um... You have argued that the Alamo occupies the physical and ideological center of the Texas myth and, and national mythology. And you wrote, how has the Alamo functioned as a tool to impose a racial order? It's not obvious, right? I mean, I just told you a story about the, a defeat of, in a battle. And if we just look at that battle, and if that battle is everything, and it kind of is, when you walk in, you're told this is the birthplace of Texas. Texas is essentially birthed at the Alamo. And you know, the Texas story you know, goes on for centuries before that and continues afterwards. I feel that, well, let, let, me, let me take a step back. Uh, the Alamo wasn't always the main symbol for the Texas Revolution. In fact, uh, immediately after the Texas Revolution, for years, most commemorations happened around the Battle of San Jacinto, the victory. Well, why would you want to separate, celebrate a, a defeat? You celebrate a victory. And so most of the celebrations took place at, around the Battle of San Jacinto. That was the commemoration. The Battle of the Alamo kind of came later. It developed over time. It developed really in the early 20th century. Uh, there's a painting at the back of the Texas Senate chamber, the mm -hmm. dawn at the Alamo. Mm -hmm. To me, that's like a text, you know, like the, 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 the Mexican soldiers climbing up like, you know, nameless, faceless hordes right. overtaking the known characters, right? Exactly. We know Travis's name. We know Crockett's name. We know Bowie's name. But we don't know the other Mexican soldiers and there were Mexican soldiers on both sides, right? Oh, there were Mexican soldiers who were Tejanos who allied themselves with the Texian cause, uh, but we don't know their names. We don't, well, we don't recognize their names. We don't repeat their names like those 
heroes of the Alamo. Exactly. I mean, most people don't know about the Battle of Medina. Oh yeah. Um, I mean, that's why, why, why is the Battle of Medina not celebrated? Why do we not know about the, Ma the Battle of Medina? I, I like to say, and I, I'm making up stuff as I go along, but I, I, I think the mythology of the Alamo is one of the greatest spin jobs I've ever seen. Um, you know, you, you got your ass kicked, and somehow this ends up being a glorious thing because these people, knowing full well that they would not make it through, gave their lives for right. liberty and, and freedom and went down fight and, and gave time for Sam Houston. It, the battle wasn't over. This is like the Battle of Thermopylae. Well, that's, uh, Jim Crisp is really good about that. If you ever uh, want to date him going that, you know, he'll, uh, he'll talk about it that way. The Boer Wars are also come to mind. Custer's Last Stand is another moment in, in American history that's, has, been both recognized as this uh, sacrifice. And I think now we've had a reckoning with Custer's Last Stand, or at least we're starting to. Sure. We're, we're thinking of Lakota history differently than we, oh, than we have yeah. in the past. Absolutely. And I think uh, it's important to, to look at uh, the, this question, which is what is the Alamo historically and what is the Alamo as a myth? What, how did the Alamo as a story, as a get imbued with this power that has not only supported it to this day, but ha has magnified the, the rationale, the, the story, the, the importance of this narrative. And the importance of the narrative is that if that moment is the birth of Texas, that means that there was nothing before that. And at that moment, that's when, th when history begins. That's when the story begins. Our personal stories begin at our birth. The Texas story begins at the Alamo. Well, if you begin your story at the Alamo, then of course Mexican people are immigrants. They don't, they're not already there. They don't, they don't belong. They're outside of that story. Indigenous people, are nowhere to be found. And frankly, if that's our birth, then we have to seriously question the role of slavery in the, that birth of Texas. Look, when we talk about the Americans who came to Texas, they were Americans, but they were Americans from one particular region in the United States. They were Southerners, fully. They, and as such, they believed that they were bringing not only themselves, but their way of life to Texas. And that way of life included their form of agriculture, which they could not conceive of without slavery. They also brought with them their political structure. They started running their towns like they were back at home. They would have a judge, they would essentially play by their rules. And that's what the, Mexicans authorities, or the Mexican authorities noticed, that they were not Mexicanizing uh, when they immigrated to, to Mexico, when they immigrated to Texas. They were, uh, so they were Southerners. And th I think this is one part of Texas that gets, that is challenging. And, and, and um, you know, I talk about how Texas is outside of analysis, you know, doesn't get examined the same way, say, the Confederacy gets examined and the Civil War is scrutinized. And part of that is uh, because Texas has been talked about as outside of that history, even though it's constitutive of that history. It's part and parcel of American westward expansion. It's part and parcel of manifest destiny. It's part of really and centrally a southern expansion of slavery. Southerners believe that that, that form of life was, had, had its future across the West and into the South as far as Mexico and Central America. They were not interested in stopping with what they had. Uh, they, you know, we think of the Civil War as uh, you know, triggered by uh, 
fugitive slave laws and limits on slavery in the North, the limits on slavery in the North were just part of the story. The other part is the, the, the conviction that so many Southerners had that their way of life uh, should be spread. Should, you know, that's, that was the, the, the civilization that should be uh, colonizing the West and colonizing Latin America. Mm. I was asking several different scholars this kind of question um, uh, about the 1836 project. And said that's kind of strange, taking 13 days, basically, uh, and focusing on 1836. And I said, wasn't it that uh, the area won an award, UNESCO award, that would talk about, uh, you know, San Antonio de Valor in 1718? And it gets back to what you were just talking about. It almost seems to me, if you're going to say that, you know, the birth of Texas is 1836, what you're doing is you're negating all the other indigenous populations that were, were there. I have um, spoken to Ramon Vasquez, the Tapilam Nation, mm -hmm. and, you know, one of the things that Ramon said, we just want to be included in the story. Um, and, of course, the, the you know, more than a thousand indigenous people buried you know, at the site of the, the present Alamo and wanting to uh, go out there and have proper burials. And Ramon said, he said, you know, we're not trying to stop the Disneyland that they're trying to build there. You know, what we're trying to do is include us in the story. We've been here anywhere between 10 and 14,000 years. Right. Uh, the Tejanos are often window dressing. Let's throw a Wansigim here and say, hey, we're we're covering, you know, the, the Tejanos here. But... You know, you made a, a point that I want to I want to ask you here because it was something as a professor um, that that I was inspired by. What when you explain Texas to your your students, and you, and you're talking about you know the, the place that is out there. Can you elaborate a little bit on on that? Sure. So I I teach Texas history. I've been teaching Texas history for almost twenty years now. And, uh, you know, when you grow up in Texas, you get a lot of Texas history. You get Texas history in second grade. I mean, sorry, when you grow up in Texas, you get Texas history both in fourth grade and in seventh grade. In elementary school and in middle school, they get you twice. And the State Board of Education mandates that, and that's the law of the land. Texas goes one step further. Every kid wakes up in the morning, combs their hair, brushes their teeth, goes off to school, walks in all bleary-eyed, and uh, first thing in the morning, students stand up by their desks and uh, pledge allegiance to the American flag. And you know what they do right after that? They pledge allegiance to the Texas flag. Uh, I don't know of any state that has their, their kids, school kids, uh, say two pledge of allegiance uh, in, in uh, in every more every in school every morning, so certainly when you're a school kid, you don't know why you're doing that. Uh, you, you're reminded you're in Texas, but what does that mean? Uh, when I ask my students why do you, why should we study Texas history, and a lot of times I would get well, so we so we can understand why Texas is so great, you know, and so they they already have the answer. We know Texas is great. We'd like to find out why it's so great, and. You know, that's fine in, second, in, in elementary school, that's fine in middle school, but you're in college now, right? And when we sit here in a college class, uh, our, question, our, our role as, as historians is not to say uh, that this is the way it is, but to ask questions and to ask if. Rather than saying, well, we have freedom because of the Battle of San Jacinto and the Republic of Texas. We can say, did the, the Battle of San Jacinto, did the Republic of Texas lead to more freedom, more liberty, and for whom? And, and those are the kinds of questions I, I like to ask. Now, Texas in particular gives us an opportunity to really see a continental history. You know, this is, a place where so many empires came together. The Spanish and Mexican Empire, the American Empire, uh, Southern Empire, as I was talking about, and indigenous empires. 
there was an entire Comanche empire in Texas. And, and we're seeing those empires more and more. So I like to tell my students, this history is important, not just because of what it is, but because of where it is. It's at the intersection of peoples. It's at the intersections of these cultures and languages and beliefs. And as much as some would think that it only results in an inevitable clash of cultures, we see just as many examples of cooperation, of intermarriage, of understanding, of reaching out, of growth. Uh, there are moments, I like to think of Texas, uh, that it could have become almost like a, a Switzerland uh, type place. With the cantons? It, it, well, where, you know, what's the dominant language in Switzerland? Well, it's all of them, right? What's the, it, it's that idea that, um, and I think my, my, my sincere belief is that Mexico felt that was a possibility. At least they had to. I, you know, Spain was very restrictionist in its colonies. I mean, when you look, when you compare the British colonies to Spanish colonies, the British colonies were wide open. Right? They and the Spanish did not open their colonies, and there, and Mexico was reluctant initially to open up. And this was an experiment, essentially, in Texas, an experiment to open up its frontier to development and perhaps benefit as I believe uh, Americans felt that opening up America would benefit them, benefit, that there would be a benefit to, you know, new cultures, new farming techniques. Now they came, they, they also saw that there was, uh, that that would come with things that they didn't want, right? Mexico had abolished slavery in 1829. So that was an, a challenge that they maybe initially looked aside, but eventually it, be, it, it festered and, and, and never went away. Yeah, one of the things I, I believed I, I learned from Miguel Quiroga's book is this kind of idea of pragmatism and, and self-interest that you could get Tejanos and you could get Anglos working together um, supporting federalism as opposed to centralism, as a way to look after each other mm -hmm. um, and you know, have that particular kind of self-interest as, as well as get along with each other in, in the communities uh, you know, that they were, they were involved in. Um, I found that very interesting. Also, Andres uh, Tierrina, um, I, I, I am guilty of this. I kind of thought of a Tejano almost as a monolith. Mm -hmm. This is kind of like what I Tejano is, right. and then when you start to see the, the differences of, of political opinions, you know, Tejanos that supported Mexico, Tejanos that supported the, the Anglo, people that, that shifted, you know, constantly. Uh, I think in Sam Haynes' new book, he talks about that. There's, everything's in a state of flux. Everything is, right. is anarchy. It's constantly changing where somebody was firm here at one point. You know they're they're not there anymore, and I, I think that really goes to the you know speaks to the diversity and the the kind of changing um, political scene. Now, and, and and just to 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 add a point to that, my own feeling is there were people that there were Tejanos that supported the Texians. There were other Tejanos who were critical of Mexico, but were not willing to oppose it in the same way and ultimately when push came to shove supported it right? but my own feeling is the vast majority wanted to be left in peace wanted to be able to to, to protect their families to uh, have their farms to keep their livelihood going and were happy to support whatever side was going to let them be themselves and continue their their practices and their traditions and their lives in peace yeah and uh, and so, how do we tell that story in history? That, I think that's a that's a challenging history. But just to finalize that point, we can talk about the diversity in Tejano perspectives, the heterogeneity in their lives, the class aspects. Uh, re real, you know, you had elite Tejanos who had a, a reason for siding with one side or the other. Uh, the the landowning classes had uh, uh, 
families that lived on their farms that were uh, uh, that had allegiance to them because they were the landowner, because they were the the patron. You know that was that system of of patronage uh, was historic and deep and cultural and social, and and so we we can talk about the heterogeneity. The problem with the Alamo story is it erases it all. It makes it so that the only way you can see the Alamo is, well, were you for it or were you against it? What side were you on? That's how you are defined. And, and it makes that history irrelevant. So I like to talk about that history. I think that would help us understand motiv individual motivation, understand culture today. When we look at how uh, the Hanos are voting in the valley today, it, we need to see beyond uh, the, you know, the, these kinds of, of categories to see that what motivates people might be agricultural interests, might be other social interests, might be religion. You know, th th that all plays a role. So the Alamo story, I feel, is a block. It's an obstacle to seeing the rich, nuanced history that will help us not only understand that past, but understand the present as well. I'm gonna quote you here, so because I think this is directly relevant here. You said the Alamo defined who belongs and who doesn't. The Alamo represents a litmus test for entry into participation and membership in civic society. Accept the myth or be marginalized, all right? Can you talk about this idea that you argued that the myth has excluded Mexicans and Mexican-Americans? So again, I'm gonna talk about that historic Alamo and then the myth, right? And, and, and right after the, the so-called Texas Revolution, the, 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 the war in Texas, right after the Republic is founded, the Hanos are required to sign essentially loyalty oaths. They're required to sign statements saying that they never took up arms against the Texian army. Now, not a single Anglo was required to sign that oath. And right there at the beginning of the, you know, at, at, if we are to talk about the Alamo as the birth of Texas, so if we're looking at that birth moment of Anglo Texas, essentially is, it's really what it is. It's the birth of Anglo Texas. At that moment of Anglo, of the, at that moment of the birth of Anglo Texas, the Hanos are a suspect class. Their, uh, their sense of belonging, their sense of allegiance is questioned. And they have to prove themselves. They have to sign an oath. They have to sign up for the Confederacy. They have to do what it takes to, to prove that you're not an enemy, that you do belong. The story, of the story of Texas for Tejanos is that there's never enough. There's, no, there's nothing you can do that, that will prove you belong because you didn't belong at the beginning. That's the rupture I'm talking about. If, how, can you, how can you belong if you, unless you change the story, unless you open up the story? And that's why it's so important to, to to expand that narrative. I think if we're to talk about the Alamo, the Alamo, we spend a lot of time talking about it as a battlefield and not enough talking about it, time talking about it as a mission. It's both. The Alamo is both a fort and a mission. And it has to have both those identities all the time. Clearly, the visual representation of the Alamo has removed the mission. You don't see a cross on the Alamo. There was a cross. When it was built, there was a cross. It was a mission. It was a church. I mean, we're at, when we talk about the Alamo, we're talking about the church, right? What we look at also, is also missing a bell tower. You know, if it had a bell, if it was reconstructed with a bell tower, with a cross on it, maybe we would see the mission a little bit more. What we do have are the pedestals, the nichos, where the saint statues belonged. 
the empty pedestals are visible. They're there. You see them every time you look at the Alamo. But essentially what you're seeing is absence, right? You're seeing the absence of those statues of saints and, and, and the Virgin Mary and, uh, that would have been in those spaces. Can we put them back or can we imagine them there? Technology allows us to do that. The, the new plan for the Alamo is to, you hold up your iPhone camera and, and it'll place those statues there. But it, we also need to be reminded that the building we're looking at when we look at the Alamo is a restoration, an in, incomplete restoration. But it's become frozen in time and frozen in our minds in a way that it, makes it difficult to see it any other way. It was a Campo Santo uh, as well, right? You're talking about the religious aspects and, um, you know, the, the Tapilam is just is one group that I'm talking about asking for forgiveness and entering in, inside for religious services and saying, you know, we, we are guilty and we are sorrowful for the, you know, the things that are in there. And, and it gives a, a much more, you know, complete um, feeling and, and a richness that you spoke about there that I think most people want to hear about. Yeah. I mean, I teach in a Hispanic institution. Right. Um, you know, it, it serves the Hispanic you know, population. We have about 22,000. Um, my students have always craved that, I mean, to, to hear about the indigenous population, to hear about Tejanos, to hear about Mexicans, to hear about racism. My students said, oh my God, you know, we feel the, the guilt of our you know, forefathers. We don't want, want to hear that. Oh, they, they, want, they want that. They in, in, embrace it. And, it. and it becomes more, really a much more complex story. And I think also, you know, one of the, the points too, I have a, a colleague, uh, John Macias, who is kind of a docent at San, San Gabriel, uh, he's, a, he's a good friend of mine. And I, and I think the PBS that did that kind of borderlands, very interesting, uh, you know, that the indigenous people, they're very, very different views. There was one elderly lady in there said, oh, when I come to San Gabriel, it's my home. It's where I was born. I mean, she's quite elderly. And the son is appalled by that. You know, because so, it's, it's, it's a mixture of uh, right. the stuff that happened at the Alamo. Look, the, the reality is, the reality is that history didn't stop. The myth tells a frozen moment and has frozen that narrative in terms of American culture. And it's really, I would say, not only frozen it in terms of American culture, but it, it created an opening that then was filled by the American story. Look, when I ask people, here in Texas, where were you for Independence Day? What do you think you're thinking about? Independence Day is July 4th, of course. That's what we all celebrate for, what, that's what we all celebrate when we celebrate July 4th, American Independence Day. In 1776, you were in the Spanish frontier here in Houston. July 4th was imported into Texas. It was brought to Texas by Americans. In the same way, you know, we don't hesitate to talk about the Spanish bringing Catholicism into the frontier. Well, Americans brought their religion, their culture, into this frontier. And the challenge is we look at that history ahistorically. We don't see that it was any other way. The power of Manifest Destiny really is the power to make normal and natural what was constructed by human events and, and, and human actions. In other words, when we talk about the US-Mexico border, we talk about the border being where it is as though it was always meant to be there. We can't think of it any other way. We can't think that it was any other way before, the, before it is where it is now or that it could any, be any other way in the future. That's the challenge. If we think that it's possible to think of, of the border as having been built and constructed and made to what, in the way that it is, then that means it could possibly change in the future. And that's the real challenge. I think that's why there's such an investment in not 
looking backwards, not looking at that, st at that story of construction, literal construction. There's a new book by C.J. Alvarez, a historian at UT Austin, that looks at the construction projects at the border, uh, not just walls, but uh, uh, dams and, and canalization and uh, all these construction projects, including uh, walls and including uh, crossing stations, you know, the, the, these, the, that, these uh, customs houses, you know, these are all built things to symbolize, to make it real, to make what was, what's essentially a, a human uh, uh, construct real. Jim and I had the, the great uh, opportunity to go to Big Ben and we spoke mm. to Jeanette Gerardo mm. and, and I found that just so exciting when you're talking about the land and, and the water. And we took a hel uh, we took a plane ride. We're talking about what, what a wall would do uh, to stopping all, all the water and how much cooperation really took place on both sides, which is relatively new, and you could see it from the from the sky, which was a, a very interesting, you know, thing. Right. And it is, I think those things need to come out, you know, the cooperation on, on both sides, like, oh, the Rio Grande keeps going, you know, what are you going to do a, about that? Right. Um, but let me tell you a story about, um, going back to your original question, which was the litmus test. You know, why I talk about the Alamo as a litmus test. I'm a Chicano historian. In other words, I'm Mexican-American, so it's who I am, but it's also what I teach. When I, talk, when I started working on 19th century Texas, you basically had two choices. Were those Tejanos who, uh, you know, where, where do Tejanos fit in this 19th century story? They were either excluded or they fought with the Texians. Those are the ones we, we, we talk about. In other words, you can talk about Tejanos as long as they don't challenge the main story. But there's other stories, right? Were those Tejanos uh, race traitors for fighting with the Texians? Uh, uh, and, and so it gets brought into current political uh, debates, no matter what side you, you look at it. In other words, it's a, ultimately it's a, the story itself is less about an interest in those people and what happened then then how can it serve my purposes in, in the present in terms of uh, do you cooperate, do you oppose, do you rebel? Uh, we don't talk about, it's hard to conceive of the uh, whole companies of Confederate Tejanos. What do you mean Confederate Tejanos? Where did they come from? Well, they were all working with Santos Benavides and Santos Benavides was a big rancher in Laredo and he had not only uh, alliances with the Confederate leadership in Austin, but he was the connection to Vidauri in Mexico, and he was the way that the Confederacy was going to get its cotton around the Union blockade by going through Mexico. Tejanos played an incredible, incredibly central role to uh, the maintenance of the Confederacy at that point. But you did also have Union Tejanos, or actually Union Californios, who came from, uh, who, who formed whole uh, companies that came down to um, New Mexico. And they not only supported the Union Army, but they felt that their support of the Union Army was also part of their support for Benito Juarez in opposing the French occupation of Mexico at the same time. So they linked these events in their understanding of, of the Americas. Um, so it, again, it's, it's a broader story and we can see that Tejano, part, Tejano participation and, and Mexican participation, it responds to a much deeper history of the continent that we need to tell, that, that, that reaches back for um, centuries and uh, and what and only when we put it in that context can the actions of people that people take at that time really make sense the panel I was on uh, it was me talking about the Alamo uh, 
uh, it was Reverend, Reverend Hamlin, who is the uh, director of the National Cathedral in Washington, D.C., talking about four stained glass windows that were Confederate, uh, that were Robert E. Lee and Stonewall Jackson uh, stained glass windows that they are planning on removing, but the process and the conversations that they have to, to move these stained glass windows, you know, talk about a symbol of the country, the National Cathedral, right? And, and, then, um, and then the third person was from uh, UNESCO, was, a, was a, one of the assistant secretaries of UNESCO looking at World Heritage Sites, in particular uh, looking at sites of slavery in the Caribbean that are linked to British history and how um, you know, that British colonial history when slavery is told in a plantation building and you know, the artifacts that they would use. It was great. I mean, the, the, and when, so when I, I felt, I, I spoke last, but I always feel like one of the things I like to do is bring these stories together. And it worked out perfect because um, with the stained glass windows, one of the windows that Reverend Hamlin showed had Robert E. Lee and Stonewall Jackson firing a cannon and it said towards Mexico, right? And then uh, I said, there you have it. I mean, this was the southern dream of of uh, empire you know the think about it as um, we you know one history we don't talk about is the american invasion of mexico in 1846 and 1847 the united states invaded mexico took over you know uh, occupied mexico city it was an art you know it was a, it was an invasion and uh and you know nary a word in in textbooks that you ask your students they might know about it uh, but that's why we have the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo afterwards, and and it and the and that war started with the annexation of Texas in 1845 by Polk. Period. That was the beginning of that war. So so Texas, I like to think of as part one of the U.S.-Mexico War. It was a I mean, it is a U.S.-Mexico war. They're all Americans in, in that sense. Even, and that's, I think, the challenge is how do, w when we talk about another rupture, and, I'll, and I'm kind of back on the subject here again, but we, when we talk about another rupture and why Texas exceptionalism, while entertaining, is an obstacle for making the connections that need to be made to understand how those Texians, as, as they call themselves, were American. They were American when they were born because they were not born in Texas. They were American when they immigrated to Texas. They were American when they refused to learn Spanish and become Catholic, as was required by Mexico when they agreed to come to Mexico. They were American when they decided to sign up and go fight against Santa Ana as part of the Texas Revolution. They were American every day of the Texas Republic. If you were to ask them, what are you? They'd say, I'm American. They, that was who they were. But never a Mexican national. Well, it's complicated, right? Um, there's a really good biography of Stephen Austin by um, um, Greg Cantrell, um, Yale University Press. And Greg's take on Austin, and I, and I see it in the documents, is that Austin really took it seriously. He said, I was invited, I took an oath to Mexico, this is a story I like to tell about Austin. Um, at one point in 1820, okay, one point in 1826, I believe, um, there was a, a rebellion that sprung up in East Texas. Uh, a settler named Hayden Edwards decided he was gonna separate East Texas, create his own republic, call it Fredonia, and he was gonna get the Cherokee to join with him. And he uh, took up arms and he started uh, skirmishes. And Salcedo, the Mexican governor, uh, 
who was in charge of Texas, turned to Austin and said, what should we do? And Austin said, give us rifles, we'll put, it, we'll put down the rebellion. And he did. He took those rifles and Austin and his men put down the Fredonia Rebellion and Hayden Edwards. They defended Mexico. Mm -hmm. They defended Texas, but they were, they were doing it in, in, in and I believe, um, maybe they were playing a long game. Maybe they, it, uh, Austin is also known to have said that he believed Texas would eventually become part of the United States. I think the phrase he used was like a ripe peach falling off a tree. You know, it, in other words, that it would happen naturally. But it happened after a, a, a war mm -hmm. in 1836, and it happened after another war again in 1846, Absolutely. 10 years later. So I, I, you, you have to think of both Texas and the U.S. invasion of Mexico as part of the same protracted battle. You can't see them separated, and that's the challenge. Because Texas has kind of built a wall around that history by saying, well, no, this is Texas, this is different, then it, make, then it prevents us from making those connections. I think one of the, the things that you talked about, the Texas Republic and, and elsewhere, is, is deleting the whole concept of the institution of slavery. And you said that, that that institution of slavery would have tied Texas directly to the Confederacy. And in, in a lot of ways, by not having the slavery, they, they escape the, the critique and the criticism about that, that institution. I think that's what you were you were were talking about. That you talked that was one of the most grievous kind of sins is, is to leave the institution of slavery out of the narrative. And that's what's been most surprising about the latest round of Alamo battles, if you want to call it uh, the the history wars around Texas. There, the way talking about slavery. Or, so let me put it. Let me talk about it another way. When historians bring up slavery and the importance of slavery to these Southern Americans who immigrated to Texas, when you look at the way emancipation in in Mexico uh, in 1829 started some of this discontent by these American immigrants. When you look, I think most tellingly, at the Republic of Texas Constitution, which Article 9, Article 9 lays out very directly the only black people in Texas are slaves. You cannot be free and black in Texas. It unequivocally says, says that. Uh, it also says that the legislature could never abolish slavery either. So it, it's, it, it, the, the Republic of Texas forms itself as a slaveholder republic. I almost feel like if I was a lawyer, I would say, please turn your attention to Article 9 of this Constitution. I mean, my God, it, it's just such a powerful statement. And I think you had written that it was irreconcilable with the idea of these people fighting for life, liberty, you know, the pursuit of happiness out right. here. When you've enacted something like that, how, how do but you it's, reconcile? But it's, and, and, this is, and this is a question that's coming up now around patriotic history. What, one of the, I think the most, uh, you know, it's clear that it doesn't, match, right? You have these, so what a lot of the folks that are bristling at a complete telling and a, and a thorough telling of this history, what they bristle at talking about slavery is they realize it doesn't match. They're not arguing that slavery is liberty. What they now say in this legislation is that, that it's a, an aberration, that it's, uh, that the values are there, but they're not being upheld by those in power at that time. But they have, that, but that, you know, as 
King would say that the you know arc of justice, you know that that the arc of history bends towards justice. This idea, is that, but we eventually got there. Now, what they don't tell you is you can only get there through uh, a civil war. You could only get there through civil rights battles. You could only get there through defending those rights and opposing those uh, places where it's where they're where they're abridged and where they're abrogated and so. This, that's, that's what goes unsaid. And when you bring up those cases, we're like, well, here's people that are really are fighting for independence or, or equality. Uh, and I wouldn't say that Santana was necessarily fighting for equality. I think he was fighting for the territorial integrity of his nation, right? Um, yet his nation was... A, a, a nation that had abolished slavery. 1829 with Guerrero, right? So, yeah, I, so, I think that's... In, and, and I don't think he was going up there saying that, that uh, we're going into Texas to abolish slavery in Texas either, right? He was, abol he was putting down a rebellion, period. Right. The other part was a complication that maybe would have been a problem later, uh, eventually if... The United States, you know, again, we know 10 years later, the United States does invade, you know. It, I don't like to talk about counterfactual history, but but if we but going back to how Americans were viewed in Mexico, they were viewed as as slaveholders that break treaties with indigenous people. You know, when when um, Cherokee starts streaming in to Texas, into Mexican Texas, they say, look, we're leaving Georgia and our lands because we had all these deals with the Americans and they broke treaty after treaty. We need to come to a place where those treaties will be respected. And they felt that might have been possible in, in frontier Mexico. Sure. I want to see if we can do a couple rapid fire um, uh, answers there. Okay. I, I, I'm looking at things that really uh, move me. My wife has sworn I'm never coming back to Texas again because I said I just need one more interview. And she said, my God, if you, if you, you know, I've, I've got to go out there and say, oh, well, and she said, you know, this is the last one here. So the, these are, again, <clears throat> things that, that you have talked about so they don't have to be like, um, does the mythology of the Alamo intersect and embody the nation's history of enforcing a racial order through violence and the campaigns of white supremacy and slavery that accompanied America's expansion west. Again, that, <laughs> there's the Alamo, what happened in the Alamo, the myth. So let me talk about the Alamo myth. And, and I think the things that, that kind of hit me in the, in the, in the inspired is like, you know, the, the drive for slavery that often gets left out here. Um, uh, I think it's very difficult just to say the superiority of whites, and I just want to say it out kind of loud. Yeah, and, 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 and manifest destiny. And when, when folks look at, at the 19th century and they say, well, they're not, uh, by the way, it, they would come out and say, well, of course, Anglo Saxon culture is superior. Nobody would doubt that. So if there's something that's so taken for granted, so commonsensical, like why, it does not even bear repeating, you know, that there was, you don't have to say it because you don't have to defend yourself around an opposing view that, that your culture might somehow be inferior or, or, or at least that there would be some equal race and some equal culture. There, there was no equal culture. It was uh, the Anglo-Saxon cultural superiority was part and parcel of manifest destiny ideology. So what I see the challenge is, is because we don't talk about the Alamo as part of manifest destiny, and that we then don't see that connection between the racial and cultural superiority that goes along with manifest destiny embedded in that Alamo story. 
and 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 so that so that that's the challenge here. When we were talking at the beginning about the Alamo as a place that consecrated the land, I was being very literal. In other words, manifest destiny is an ideology. It's not a policy. There was no law of manifest destiny that Congress passed, right? This is a cultural, a way of describing a cultural manifestation of, manifestation of American society at this point. One that, by the way, is still prevalent in our society. Why can we uh, demand that American you know, soldiers just walk in anywhere and settle any problem, right? That, that it's the idea that the United States represents order and in the in a world of chaos. So here's the uh, crux. Then, if uh, ha I said before that um, the power of manifest destiny is that it normalizes American expansion, is that it says American expansion is not only right and justified, it is legitimate and it is a sacred right. And that's the consecration that's going on in the Alamo. That's the blood that is spilling that makes the land part of the American story. And, and essentially it, it separates it from that Mexican story, that indigenous story, that continental history, and, 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 and really brings it into the embrace of, of American history. Something that goes, it really dovetails well, I think, here. It says, you have argued that the Battle of the Alamo is where the campaign of Southern slavery and Native American genocide, which was very powerful, migrated west and express, expressed itself in the demonization of Mexicans. And I think that's obviously what I'm trying to do in my documentary is connect the dots. That you can look at the demonization of, of Mexicans today and Mexican Americans and, 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 and see where it was already taking place. And I think that's something that, that you, you spell out here. So it's, I mean, when we're done, I'll show you that. Have you seen this political ad that the governor of Alabama, Ivy, um, I forget her first name. Uh, Governor Ivy of Alabama is, you know, running for re-election, and she put out a 15-second spot. Basically, says Joe Biden is opening up the border to Mexicans. We're going to have to learn Spanish before you know it. And I say, no way, Jose, to that. And um, what's amazing is how this debate around the border has become nationalized. You would think somebody who lives in Omaha is on the border, right? That's how we talk about it. That's the panic people have, that, that somehow we all live in the border, no matter where we live. Now, if you know you live, if you do live near the border, it's not like that at all. I mean, the, the, and in fact, it's been a, a very diverse place for as long as we've known. And this is my point. Texas has always been this rich polyglot, place and what the Alamo story does is it, it it hinders our ability to bring that richness out and connect the present with the past so that the only story we get is the one of the of the justification of everything that had to happen to get us to where we are now you know when people when when students try to defend slavery, sometimes they'll say, "Well, you know, it it was a necessary evil that got us to to build a better society that we we have now." Well, first of all, um, did anybody ask? You know, the, it, it, this is uh, it, it wasn't really a sacrifice, and we don't certainly haven't thought of it that way or compensated folks that way. Um, but that but um, that's again putting this idea that putting ideology above reality right so going back to i i think it where, where i think so let, i think there's two parts to what you were saying the first part is that 
the Battle of the Alamo represents or unites these impulses in American history and, and concentrates them in Texas, again, because of where Texas is. It's the frontier of American slavery in Texas. It's the last resort for so many indigenous people who are trying to escape and evade American conquest. And it's the homes of Mexican and mestizo and indigenous peoples in Texas uh, before that. And all of that is essentially erased by the bright shining light that is the Alamo story and really the, the, the Texas Revolution and its glorification um, to the, that, that prevents us from seeing that, that intersection. Yeah, you know, as I digest all the, the material that I, I've looked at, um, it's interesting to me that I think it should be almost like a chapter on the power of mythology where I would give a great deal of praise to the mythology, not, not the history. Mm -hmm. But if you were looking at someone that was able to, to carve, I, I think that uh, Sam talks a little bit about what happened during the American Revolution and the legacy of our founding fathers and how that was used as a tool. Uh, you know, during the, the Mexican-American War and, and, you know, other other periods. I mean, if you can look at something and says it, it's useful, I mean, I, I don't, can't come up with anything, but it's kind of like you heard that Santa's not real and it's really pissed you off today. And you said, all, everything that you believed in has fallen apart. So I understand. I mean, I grew up, I'm a 62-year-old man. I grew up with the, the album. I loved it. As we were Look, talking about before, but not that was not the, the history, but the... so I'm I'm you know I'm at this point where I'm uh, I think it's important to understand that Texas, the idea of Texas is powerful and it does give you something right. It does it, it does uh, mean something, and what I will say it means a lot to Tejanos when I'm uh, when I meet. Uh, Chicanos across the country. If I, if I, when I went, I went to college in New Jersey, and uh, when the the California Chicanos would come, we'd have a football game. It was the Texans versus the Californians, and you know that that was, um, and poor New Mexicans like had to kind of figure out which side they were on. But they, you know, they would kind of split. <laughs> they would split uh, between the two, and we'd and we'd all say like, oh, we don't understand those New Mexicans. They're too different. Um, Look, it's, it's um, Texas means a lot to black Texans. When you see now the nationalization of Juneteenth, that was and is a black Texan uh, celebration. In her, in her recent book on Juneteenth, an, Annette Gordon-Reed, a historian of Harvard and of, of Thomas Jefferson and Sally Hemings. Um, Annette Gordon-Reed wrote, Texas is a white man, period. The, this is the challenge. Drive around, look around. Everyone sees that. Texan is an open signifier, should be uh, disconnected from gender and race and ethnicity because there are Texans of all genders and races and ethnicities, right? Uh, but the myth, the Marlboro man cowboy is a white man. That's the challenge. Because everyone knows that that's not the truth, and I would say everyone, but the, but the myth is so strong and so powerful and so attractive that it, it obviously meets some kind of need. I, you know, one day you should go to the, the, the Houston Rodeo. And it's not the rodeo itself, but the parade 
that happens before the rodeo because the parade includes trail riders, groups that come from north, south, east, and west, from Louisiana, from, Mexi from the U.S.-Mexico border, from east Texas, from west Texas. Uh, the music you hear, the language you hear, the food that you have is incredibly diverse. That's the real frontier. That's the real Texas. That's the real history of the West. Just say what you just said. I, I was stuck on something you said, and I didn't hear the whole thing. We were talking about the real West and the rodeo and, and, and the diversity there. Well, I, what I was saying is, you know, we have this idea of a cowboy. If I say the word cowboy to you, you think of a white man on a horse. The reality is that it's not that way, and frankly, it's never been that way. The work that it takes out in, on the ranch, out in the fields, and out, you know, the work, that work is done by everybody. Look, cowboy is not a white man. All you have to do is look around. You look around now, but I would say, it's always been the case that it's been an incredibly diverse group. Go to the Houston Rodeo Parade. And that parade includes uh, dozens of trail riders who have spent two weeks riding uh, their horses and their wagons and camping out on the way to Houston to, just to arrive right at the moment of the, of the parade. And you look and they've, those Trail riders have come from Louisiana, they've come from the border, they've come from East Texas, they've come from far West Texas, and they all come together. And the language you hear, the music you hear, the food that you taste represents all of these cultures and all of these places. Cowboy culture is the least homogenous thing in reality. But this is a place where the Hollywood myth has been so powerful that we can't appreciate that reality. You can't extricate, um, you, you know, you, you can't pull that. And, and that's what I think that, you know, if someone was saying I was going to write a myth, I think it's very powerful. I want to leave on the, this last. Oh, one, one thing we could do, we could go get barbecue right now or tomorrow morning. You could just drive around. Uh, there's a neighborhood called Acres Homes, which is really literally like 15 blocks that way. And there is people have horses in their houses, like in their yards there. And. And they're all African-American. And there's like black cowboys with their cowboy hats on riding their horses down the street. Well, in the Carolinas, in the colonial period, there were first black cowboys in the, in the Carolinas. It's always been that way. Yeah. But, but Hollywood sure. was so complete. And by the way, Hollywood didn't invent this, right? I mean, this was the dime store novel. The, this was the, the, the right, the the cowboy songs, you know, th th this is a part of a larger project. I would say maybe tra you can trace to Daniel Boone, right? And, and, uh, um, and the, the myth of the frontiersman that captivated, um, you know, cap captivated not only Americans, but Europeans who felt that that's the real America. That was well, it's almost America like was. if you ever saw what Teddy Roosevelt, when he thought he was a man of the West, it's, it's so laughable to see his gear. And he was laughed at by the people of the West. What the hell do you wear? And you know, those things, you think you're a, a, a cowboy out in, out in the West. And that's a, well, you know, I mean, I mean, you know who the largest collector of Texas, of Alamo memorabilia is? Phil Collins. Phil Collins, right? Yeah. You know, I mean, that, that's yeah. how, Global, global, and and you know it was exported, right? That uh, you know the Wild Bill show was taken to Europe, right? That, that and and uh, Annie Oakley and all of those stories. So so we're almost getting it back. I mean, we did get it back with the spaghetti westerns, right? That were that's you know the that uh, Sergio Leone like distilled and and, and crystallized those, into know. like the most essential version of that myth to the point that it was cartoonish, right? Yeah. I, 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 one of the, the exercises I do in my classes, we go from the man with no name and Clint Eastwood in that film to Unforgiven. And you're like, 
that's that's the the shift that our culture is uh, is going to. I I believe we're at a time where you know Unforgiven, Nomadland, uh, Year of the Dog, that's out right now. You know, we we are get we are able to tell these stories. Uh, Brokeback Mountain. You know, we are able to tell these stories of the West, um, and the, and and I think they have an audience, and they are, and and people do receive them because they feel that that cartoon version that has been handed to us is doesn't work, yeah. doesn't explain things as they are. It might tell a story of how things should be, but that has been more destructive than it has been constructive. Yeah. To, to finish up, uh, if that's okay, um, Jim and I, I know, and I can't even see Jim, we've been dreaming of a beer um, and a sleep and, and everything else but that. But I, I do want to say in all sincerity, I, I think that, you know, your article has kind of changed my trajectory. And I think one of the things that I've been looking at is, is the mythology. Uh, they call them greasers was very interesting to me because at the point of, of context, some of the arguments that were made, and I, I wrote to Miguel that I've read widely, not always deeply. I mean, my, my doctorate was an early American colonial revolution. That, that was my, I studied with Leonard Levy, who wrote the Origins of the Fifth Amendment. Son of a, anyway, the uh, Pulitzer Prize, you know, winner <laughs> and stuff like, like that. But it, 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 and just like just summarize that stuff, what, what would you like students to take away from, from that article? I mean, I know my students will read it. I'm on sabbatical. But when I go back and for after the 4th of July, but as, as I told you, I found it so pithy. I mean, I could take two sentences of yours and say, stop. Well, it's funny. I wrote, I wrote that piece. Um, I, I wrote that piece after giving a talk at the American Psychoanalytic Association. Uh, they were having their annual conference in Austin and they were very troubled because uh, the Texas legislature had just passed you know, these gun bills that were just allowing guns everywhere, these anti-immigrant bills, and they almost canceled their conference. They said, well, how can we support this? And they, their answer was, well, let's invite these scholars to come and and talk to us. You know, half of them are coming from New York and California. They want to know this story. So I, so that this piece is what I it was essentially was the talk I gave. How do I explain to a bunch of psychoanalysts? You know, what is what's up with these Texas? You know, what's up with Texas? Um, and um, I, I think here's a challenge. Outside of Texas, it's easy to, to dismiss Texas. It's easy to dismiss Texans. To say, well, they're, they're, they're a, there's a little something off about them. We don't really have to pay attention to this. Inside of Texas, it, there's a certain amount of blindness to an avoidance to engaging you know, national history, essentially. Uh, I wanted to speak in both directions. I wanted to say within Texas, like, hey, our history matters. Our history is rich. Our history connects with the continent and with the world. We shouldn't shy away with those connect from those connections. We should engage that history. We should be uh, we should see these connections and understand them and appreciate them for what they are. And the thing that's stopping us from doing that is also the thing that folks feel makes us special and different, right? That's the challenge. How can you take this story that's been held up and universalized and you know, protected and pristine and resituated in its historical and temporal context and, and maintain that something special. And again, I think this, what's special is where we are, right? We're here at this special place. And, and let's understand that story, that it has given a certain amount of 
enthusiasm and excitement and belonging. But at what cost? And how can we pay that cost back? How can we uh, share that belonging? And again, I think the way to do that is to think about that building as both a fort and a mission. Ha, 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 ha.